Welcome to the Monsters Flesh podcast, where we explore the evolution and role of women in horror, as well as familiar tropes of the genre through a feminist lens. There will be spoilers in this episode, so if you haven't seen the film yet and don't want us to ruin it for you, pause this podcast and come back when you're ready for a deep dive into it. Hi, I'm Clelia, one of the hosts of the podcast. Hi, I'm Meg, the other host of the podcast. And in this series, we are turning our attention to the representation of female monsters in horror cinema. And in each episode, we dissect one film we feel fits the bill particularly well. And today, our film is Misery. Misery! <laughs> so, Meg, would you like to do... <laughs> yeah, I have to say with a smile on my face. <laughs> Meg, would you like to give us a synopsis for the film? Yeah, absolutely. So, Paul Sheldon is finished with Misery. Or is he? He's written a new novel and this one is going to reignite his reputation as a writer, but a blizzard derails him, causing a serious accident. Luckily for Paul, his number one fan, Annie, just happened to be driving by. When he's trapped in her home with two broken legs, he gets the chance to learn what being a number one fan really means. Da, da, da. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh. I've rewatched um, the film for for the podcast mm. because um, we that wasn't the film we were going to cover initially. Uh, mm. We decided on another film, but then we both watched the <laughs> other film. <laughs> <laughs> and message was we're watching the other film that we're not going to mention on uh, on here because if we don't have anything positive to say about it, that's not what we're about. Absolutely. <laughs> but we watched the other film and decided not to talk about the other film. And then we had kind of a light bulb moment and thought, you know, what about Misery? It, she is kind of, Annie Wilkes is um, the ultimate monstrous um, uh, monstrous character, right? So, uh, so she definitely fits really well in this in this season. But um, had you seen the film recently? I mean, I, I I love it, but I realized that I actually hadn't seen it for quite a few years, and it was a very different experience watching it this way round. I I saw it a lot as a teenager, which I suppose, like teenager in my twenties, which I suppose like maybe says something about me that's. <laughs> disturbing <laughs> but I really love the book as well I think I read the book first mm, and then I watched the film um and I had not seen it in forever and then they were showing it um recently they did it as um as part of what it a double bill I'm trying to remember god honestly I'm like worst person for podcasting because <laughs> I can never remember anyone's name and I can never remember what I've done uh, <laughs> but yeah I saw it recently as a double bill at cinema and I was like this is incredible like oh, this is the cinema such, amazing. yeah and then but when we talked about doing it uh, for podcast I couldn't find it anyway so I bought it on blu-ray and I'm having a big return to physical media moment you know mm -hmm. with all this that's mm. going on about streaming and stuff disappearing and um so I own it now which is very very exciting um so i watched it and i think like like you i had a very different reaction i think watching it for the podcast like thinking about it more um yeah and and it's it is such a rich film in so many ways which we're going to talk about uh but it's <laughs> <laughs> but it is it's like such a, a deep complex film i think um that is it were really nice to watch it and think about it in them terms rather than just watching it and mm -hmm. being like, you know, this is brilliant, but like to watch it and yeah. think about it. Exactly. <laughs> break his legs, break his legs. I'm cheering the whole, <laughs> the whole way through the film. Uh, I guess for me it was, it was, I mean, like you, I mean, I, I read the novel and I absolutely loved it. Mm. And I used to watch the film quite a lot uh, in my teenage years. And then I kind of left it for a number of years. So going back to it, it was really, I mean, it was such a different experience because I guess I've always thought of this film as being about toxic fandom mm. um, and 
yeah, and and everything that, that that goes with that. But actually, watching it this this time around, it kind of, and I guess because you know, obviously, with the course and obviously with the podcast, talking a lot about you know from you know coming from a feminist perspective, mm. <laughs> it's just really interesting to see how this character is presented, but actually what she what she can represent as well, right? And and actually, yeah. that Paul Sheldon is you know the supposedly the protagonist of the story, but is actually for me watching around, I was like it's kind of an in- instrument to. Um, like a vehicle for mm. for Annie Wilkes, you know, to uh, to tell her own story, mm. and I, I did find that extremely interesting. That's a really good way of looking at it, actually. Yeah, and I think she is such a complex character. That's what I noticed this time more than I think any other time. And I think again, watching it through a lens of thinking about a, you know, we in sort of framework of this podcast and what we talk about, and actually looking at her through that lens. Um, and I mean, obviously, Kathy Bates. I mean. Powerhouse. <sighs> we love Kathy Bates. Uh, Oscar, well deserved. And I think I was thinking about that actually. And I, perhaps if someone else had played her, either ones have been that depth, and maybe you would have felt differently about her. She might have been a bit more one dimensional. But she's so layered and complex, and and you know, like you, you, or at least I do anyway. Like you swing between these different emotions towards her. Like sometimes. You think, God, you are this terrifying, like, unhinged, you know, mm-hmm. the monstrous woman. But then at other points, like, she just makes your heart hurt, doesn't she? Like, when she's made him that meal and, like, wines in a gallon jug and she's made meatloaf and she's so, you know, like, you just watch her, like, oh, like, you, you do, you, you just feel for her. And and it's yeah. it's such a... And I think that's really important because it would be really easy to make her one-dimensional and, and mm-hmm. just a yeah, villain... She- you know, but then that loses for what she represents, you know, and, and we'll talk about that, but it loses the complexity of it if you just go, Annie Wilkes is the villain, Paul is the victim. Um, Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's, that's an excellent point, and that's, um, uh, I mean, you mentioned um, Kathy Bates, an incredible performance uh, that won her an Oscar, um, which is amazing, actually, just mm. this, I mean, I was reading um, reading about uh, about the film and um, and about her winning um, uh, the Academy Award for Best Actress and uh, the Golden Globe as well, and that actually made me wonder, um, you know, how many horror films I've been, mm. <laughs> I've ever been nominated for an Oscar? Not enough. Uh, and how many, have, <laughs> no, exactly, not enough, actually. Actually, only six films in the genre have been nominated for mm. Best Picture. Um, we've got The Exorcist, Jaws, Silence of the Lambs, The Sixth Sense, Black Swan and Get Out. And only th- out of these, only three actors have ever won an Oscar for their scary movie performances. And that's Natalie Portman in Black Swan, Kathy Bates in Misery and Ruth Gordon in Rosemary's Baby. Mm. Isn't that, I mean, that's... Um, but that, I mean, obviously, we we know that the um, uh, the academy has, you know, it, it, or the industry in general is looking down on mm. on the genre. Um, yeah. So, but it, it it goes to show the strength of um, of her performance again in, in this mm. film. And like you says, I think um, if she'd been played by someone else, and um, again, she was, I think Angelique Angelica Houston and uh, Bette Midler were oh. uh, both off, both offered the role, um, uh, and it was the screenwriter who uh, suggested suggested Kathy Bates although she was quite unknown there at the yeah. time at the time and he, sh- he said she would be perfect for the role and it's kind of crazy to think I, you know as you said that if she'd been played by I just can't imagine <laughs> these two other actresses no, in the role no. only Ben Midler play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. she, would have, she might have done a fantastic job but it's it would be a different film i think as well i mean i love bet midler and angelica houston and i think you know mm-hmm. they're both really talented and wonderful um artists and, and actors but i think there is something very specific about kathy bates in terms of you know mm. physically even this idea because obviously annie's very strong we see her dragging him up out of this yeah. blizzard. So I think there's that physical element to it, but I also think maybe the fact that she was more unknown at that time might have been what helped sort of, you know, push it mm-hmm. towards an Oscar because she, you know, she's such a powerhouse, but if but because she's she's sort of less known at that point then, that's much more frightening, yeah. isn't it? There Whereas, isn't a star performance. Yeah. Yeah. When it's someone recognisable, you've got that removal from it because you're like, oh, that's Angelica Houston who I've seen in X, Y and Z. Whereas you're like, oh, who's this person? She's terrifying, you know. Mm-hmm. But it's, I mean, 
you know, I have to say this as well. Tony Collette was robbed. <laughs> Tony Collette should have won an Oscar for Hereditary. <laughs> there we go. My stance is clear. Um, <laughs> but it is. I mean, it just shows the the prejudice towards the the genre. You know that we still see today. Um, and I'm just I'm glad that she won an Oscar for it because she deserves it. I just mm-hmm. hope that that sort of travels down eventually and we get more horror uh, recognized at the awards. Yeah, exactly. No, it's great. And even though, like, I, I guess even by t- by today's standards i mean some of the films that i mentioned i think some people would have uh maybe a difficult time calling them horror but i think it's something that we talk about quite a lot as well is how you know horror is quite a uh, genre defying um mm. genre right mm. yeah <laughs> it kind of bleeds into into loads of different things um which reminds me actually i mean obviously we'll talk about this right at the end of the podcast but in terms of film recommendations uh yeah i'm excited to talk about <laughs> my uh, horror non my non-horror <laughs> horror recommendations <laughs> but let's move on and deep dive into the um into the the themes of the film yes. so um is there anything uh that 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 jumped jumped out to you uh that you know, that, that you're burning to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of my favourite sort of themes or the, the idea of it is that Annie is a metaphor for addiction. Uh, and Stephen mm-hmm. King's talks about that, that she's like a, a metaphor for his cocaine use. And so I watched it thinking about that. And I think when you watch it like that, it is so interesting because it's this idea that, you know, she keeps him small. She keeps him right in misery that he hates, but he makes money at it, you know, but he really despises mm-hmm. it. But she keeps him there doing that, you know, this idea about like addiction, keeping you in the same place. And and then I think if she is a metaphor for addiction, then, you know, that burning of the book again reinforces that idea that it keeps you stuck that you can't, you yeah. know, move on and grow. Um, and I just think that scene itself is just so heartbreaking as somebody who's, like, written, you know, a book and and if somebody tried to get me to burn it and it were my only copy, I'd be absolutely <laughs> petrified. You know, I'd be heartbroken as well. You just watch him and as ashes are, like, raining down on him and she's screaming right <laughs> around the bedroom, you know, but the heartbreak on his face, it's, like, really moving. But uh, I think that relationship then is so complex because, again, there's that idea about, you know, if she is representative of this sort of addiction, then she knows him best and she can manipulate him Mm -hmm. easily because she knows him, she understands him, even the dark side of him. Um, And she knows everything about misery. But then I think it is interesting that she like pushes him to be a better writer when she's like, no, you can't cheat. You've got to write it properly. You're not, you're not (laughs) like, you know, she like really pushes him forward. Um, And and then by end, I mean, he he does seem to value her critique, even though he's like, this woman's a maniac and she's got me hostage in her house. But it does seem like when she's reading, he's like watching her face, like, does she like it? What does she think? You know, it's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Waiting for approval. Yeah. And then, you know, ending is wonderfully violent. And I think it really speaks to that idea about how brutal it is to overcome addiction to, you know, and to be forever changed. Like I think that ending is a very hopeful one through that lens because, you know, he don't care about what anybody else thinks. He's sort of writing for himself, living for himself. He's come through other side of this experience and he's like a freed front weight of other people's expectations. And all it took were two broken legs and smashing somebody in the face with a pig door stop. <laughs> A lesson for us all. I mean, it, it, it feels better in the film than in the original novel, right? Because mm. in the original novel, she actually chops his um, chops his feet off. <laughs> well, I <laughs> was thinking I think it... about that. Sorry, I'm just cutting a crush there in my excitement. Um, I was thinking about that. That's really interesting that they did that because, uh, yeah, I mean, I remember, I've not read book for years, but I remember that scene really vividly. I actually, like, cuts his foot off with an electric carving knife and then, like... Mm-hmm. cauterizes it but sets bed on fire you know like i really remember it um and i and i think it were interesting to me that they made that choice and i don't know whether it's like an effects thing whether they thought we can't do that justice or i don't know to me it felt like there was something about maybe that were too permanent a change like that it'd be you know his yeah. ankles are leal and he'll be and he can walk again but to me, if you are looking at it as like this metaphor for addiction, that is the th- you are forever changed, and I think that is a really exactly to see the the scar of it remains, and like they sort of got rid of that in this. I mean, I'm not saying he's not psychologically mm-hmm. scarred because obviously, <laughs> and we know he is, but yeah. <laughs> but I, and I just I just thought thought that were really, or maybe it's about you know not wanting him to be seen as 
like disabled for instance we know there's a lot of erasure mm-hmm. in a sort of different bodies in cinema and, and and i do think that choice is an interesting one and i'd be in, i'd yeah, that was yeah. a con- so that was a conscious choice. I think mm. the the um, the screenwriter really liked the way that it was written in mm. novel, but Rob Reiner, who directed the film, and which is always, by the way, always blows my mind that it's, that that is Rob Reiner <laughs> who directed this film. Who did? I mean, it, his his body of work is just so diverse. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you take Misery and then Princess Bride, yeah. just think this yeah. is, no, there's quite um. Yeah, quite a difference there. But yeah, so like, so he insisted that um, that he be changed so that she would only break his ankle, and he felt that the visual depiction of an amputation would cause the audience to hate Annie instead of instead of being able to, to somehow sympathize mm. with her madness. That's um, interesting. In quite so. So yeah, so con- conscious quote there for um, uh, yeah from the uh, from the director to do that, which I think is is really interesting. But I. I you know, again, like you, I think if you read it in a in 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 um in an addiction, you know, as as a metaphor for addiction, I think the idea of being permanently, you know, physically uh, <laughs> changed as well as um as well as emotionally, um, in, you know, interesting. Again, it would mm. have been yeah. I think you know, in terms of making a film with him having lost both his feet, would have been mm. you know really quite different. Mm. Um, <laughs> so I so, think yeah, I think yeah. That it was probably quite love that. And I, but I think that's that's really interesting, actually. And you've answered my question, you see, as you always do, clearly. You've answered the question. But I think that is interesting because... It, and also very refreshing, I think, to see uh, particularly a male director saying, I want this woman to be complex and I don't want people to just mm-hmm. feel one way. I don't want them to just eat her. Because I think so often we see representations of women um, and again, I can think of examples, but I'm not going to give them because we're not we're not here for that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, where women are very one dimensional, or the motives just don't make sense because they're not fully fleshed out, they're not really thought out. They're just like a like a standing, you know. It's it's like I suppose like Michael Myers, but but we're less <laughs> we're like less yeah. gravitas. They're just they're there, but the the there's no. There's no like yeah they they it's just evil and there's no yeah uh, yeah, there's, yeah. There's explanation for it or or or, or way to so, I mean sympathize is a strong word though because I'm not sure I mean we do we certainly feel for her like I, as you said mm. and you know at, at the start there are some scenes where you genuinely feel like that you know she obviously has a backstory mm. you know I, you don't know if she's you know a, a, a product of abuse and neglect mm. you know but there's certainly the sense that you know, she doesn't have family she doesn't have friends mm. um you know there is that great scene in the film where you, you know you, you manage to break break out of the room and he gets to the phone and he finds the phone and the phone is completely mm. empty inside and in a way i think that's a great visual metaphor for mm. annie as well because she's you know trying so hard to be you know that idea of 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 femininity that she has built up in her mm. mind. You know, the misery for her is a is a you know either a projection of you know of femininity that she wishes she could possess, mm. or you know there's also a reading of the film I think as you know as Annie as a as a queer character as well. So either yeah. it's like through projection or sexual de- you know repressed sexual desire, but but I think it is a great visual meta- metaphor to, to like she's she's um you know she's trying so hard to display that that image to the world and and to him and as soon as it shatters then you know she gets those uh, violent outbursts mm. um and she, she she can't keep up the 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 pretense yeah well it's it's like when you see her when she's not around when she's driving or when she's moving around, her face is just blank, like there's no expression. And I think that's um, chilling to, you know, to a a certain point, but also it speaks to that idea about this facade that she's putting on for other people, that she's, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think she is a very, like a monstrous person you know when when he finds that scrapbook and he sees that all her achievements are just she's she's framed all her achievements like they're surrounded by death like her husband's death and then it's there that she's been med ed nurse and there's all these things and then obviously we know she she's a she's a baby killer isn't she you know she's like the worst mm-hmm, of the mm-hmm. worst that a woman can be she's someone who hurts children but it it's i mean i'll talk a little bit about that later as well that sort of angel of death thing but I think it's it's clear that it's because she like wants to be needed 
you know, like nursing Paul back to health. It's like she takes it, it gives meaning mm-hmm. to her life that she can she can help him. And, you know, when she's so proud of how she's reset his legs and she, you know, she's obviously this this lonely person living in just pure isolation. That I suppose is of her own making. Like she ain't got a phone. She lives in this farm in the middle of nowhere. But when you know that she's had this, she's been to prison. She's had this court, so you know, this court case that's been really publicised. I think you can understand why she sort of took herself off and lives. Yeah. You know, <laughs> lives in woods making. Yeah. Of um. Course. But I, I, I think what's what is really good and what they did bring from the book is how she just sort of drops these little things. She just peppers these little things in really randomly, you know, like, that's why I couldn't remember mm-hmm. all stuff. They asked me outstanding in Denver and it's like, what, what do you mean? And, and, mm-hmm. you know, she, yeah. and yeah. then says about, you know, talking about doing night shifts and did a lot of reading and how misery just made her forget a loneliness, a, a problems, you know, and, but then you see that this, when she, you know, that scene where she's so depressed and she's like, I've got this gun and I might put bullets in it. And and it's not about Paul. That's like something that has followed her through her life. This depression, yeah. this like, you know, crushing depression. And yeah, I think there is an element to that. She's been like driven mad by isolation. But when she's talking about chapter plays and the sense of fairness and injustice as a child, it's obvious that she's always had this, like Pearl really, I, I think mm-hmm. you can see Absolutely. a lot of yeah. a lot of Annie in Pearl. This idea that people think she's strange and she don't know why she's strange, but she's always been odd, you know. Yeah, exactly. And there's also that idea of uh, her being an unreliable narrator, right? Because um, yeah. even though you you know once you get the full, the full picture, you come kind of just same with Pearl. You kind of understand that she. I don't think she would have the emotional capacity to lie uh, in, mm. or, or, you know, I mean, obviously she has, you know, the emotional capacity to, to manipulate people mm. um, in that way. But, you know, when she peppers those things throughout the film, there is a sense of, you know, is she, you know, why is she saying those things and are they true? You know, mm. is she letting down her guard or is she, you know, is she sending him in the wrong direction? Um, so I think it's really interesting and it's really um, through these little actions that you you get the full picture of mm. who she is and why and you know to get a window into why she might be doing the things that she's doing yeah because i mean you never find out you never find out why she you know did what she did she, that's never um mm-hmm. never explored but i think you see how she is like a shark really she's like a very she's a very dangerous person like you, you can see it when you know, Buster comes and she's like, oh, I've been writing. Do you want to read a couple of hundred pages? Knowing that he's going to be like, oh God, please don't make me read it. Like she, she <laughs> plays with people and like you say, manipulates. Yeah. She knows, she knows what she's doing. So she's this real complex mix of quite childlike, un, yes, unguarded childlike, honesty, yeah. but then this real manipulative mind that's capable of a sort of seeing how to work people and set things up to her advantage. Great. So we've talked a little bit about uh, that idea of um, Annie Wilkes as a metaphor for um, addiction. And so I was to bring a little bit of theory into <laughs> this. Uh, I was reading an essay by Douglas Kesey, uh, Masculinity, Masochism and Stephen King's Misery. And in it, he argues that um, Annie is the castrating mother figure, uh, the stifling and emasculating threat of dependency. Mm. Um, and so, so again, I, I think that's, uh, you know, bringing another reading into it um and seeing and that that's that was kind of my impression w- watching it this time around is how she represents really the fear of male ca- castration as well so you know it kind of it feels a little bit just the same way that you know with addiction it's about you know that you know overcoming this but seeing you know reading annie as a mother figure i think it, it is really interesting especially with the with with the angel of death mm. you know context behind it as well mm. um i was wondering where you you know if you have any thoughts on that i mean we all know uh that i'm not always a fan of psychoanalysis uh, you know, fried's the worst. Um, <laughs> and and I think this idea that, you know, all men are just waiting to have the dick chopped off and, you know, all want to, like, bed down with mummy is a bit reductive. But I think that idea about vulnerability is really, is really interesting in this film. And I think 
that's one of the things that I like so much about it is that it's a man in that position with a woman in in charge, which so often, especially in horror, we see men mm. doing horrible things to women and you know, women, um, that's it. That I think that is much easier for people to take because it's the status quo, men hurt women. You know, that's very, mm-hmm, we see it in mm-hmm. news every day. And I think to flip that and to, and not only to flip it in a way that, you know, Annie is a real threat to him. She's physically strong. She's, she's yep. um, you know, well-trained in, in many, many drugs that could kill him. <laughs> you know, she's a threat. Mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. not a token, oh, well, he just needs to get his strength back and then he'll be able to have a power. Like you see no. that in fight at end. Like it's a very, they're very well matched. Um, and it's, and obviously, you know, Paul prevails and that's, again, like we've talked about before, the monster has to die at the end. That's the way that we we tell stories. But up till that point, it's not a case of, oh, he's just, you know, it, it, she is a threat and it, and his masculinity is threatened and i think there is a maternal element to it in how she she tends to him you know like that when he mm-hmm. wheezes in that bottle and then she's like shaking it. i mean it's so funny as well as a film like really darkly funny when she's just shaking that mm. bottle of piss while she's talking the, to him and yeah, he's the, like, oh, oh. Oh. <laughs> you know and like with pig with pig coming in and he's like disgusted by this pig. I mean, poor misery. She ain't done out. It looked like a fine pig. Oh, I no, thought, I lovely I little love misery. misery. The fellow, you know, favorite yeah. character. But I guess it's more in more in the sense of you know that idea of motherhood. I guess it's it's more in mm. the sense of that um, you know idea of of total dependency yeah. and vulnerability. You know, mm. to, towards towards one person. So I guess in that respect, she does, you know fulfill that role and, oh yeah um, yeah definitely i mean because because uh, yeah. she is i mean there's the isolation factor as well that even if he could get out in his wheelchair for instance he's got nowhere to go so it's mm-hmm. it's very um he is totally dependent on her and, and when she says to him you know if i die you die it's the he i think then he he fully understands then the pickle that he's in you know it's and i think when you first see him start saving them uh, which is a reading of it I'd not thought about till I watched it this time. But when he's saving all them pills, I did think for a minute, like when he first started saving them, is he saving them for her or is he saving them for himself? Mm-hmm. Because he is so totally dependent and there is no way out and no one's coming. And, you know, how strong, I suppose then it becomes like how strong is his will to survive this? Um, yeah. That he's going to get out. Um and and I think what they do so masterfully with that as well is that tension, that like ticking clock. So when he sees her and she goes mad about and spills soup and then he knows she's reading book and oh, I've only got this many pages left. I've only got this many pages. And you're like, oh God, oh no. <laughs> but then that ticking clock of dependence as well, like she knows his legs are getting better. She knows that he's going to be able to defend himself in a way and then obviously she hobbles him and that look of just absolute like erotic ecstasy on her face when she smashed his ankles is (laughs) is Mm -hmm. yeah she gives that monologue about like the yeah it's just it's just so powerful (laughs) but if you horrifying horrible yeah but i think when you look at it through that lens of like the castrating mother that she it's an interesting way to look at that scene in particular. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, in, in, you know, <laughs> I'm not a mother and hopefully, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure like if some, you know, um, uh, <laughs> a mother listens to this, she's probably not going <laughs> to you know, lo- love the metaphor that I'm trying to um, to do here. But, you know, the, that idea of, you know, when your baby is becoming, you know, when it's, you know, when it's time to stop breastfeeding, yeah. maybe I know that some mother have that, you know, that, you know, it's just, it's, it's a really difficult um, um, bond to break and to mm. accept that it is over. Mm. So I feel like in that in 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 that sense, you know, her hobbling um, hobbling him is is the, is the same thing as her refusing to mm. you know to stop that total dependence that you know that he has on him, as well as making sure that he's not able to yeah. <laughs> to leave. You know, yeah, yeah. But I do think there is a uh, again, it's that complexity of it, like that complexity of their dynamic. There, it does have elements of that in it as well, and. I just and I'm only thinking about it in that way now because you've you've mentioned that. But even when he learns how to manipulate her, so when he says, "I'm in pain, take me pain away, please, won't you take me pain away?" Like he knows that that's what she wants. Mm-hmm. She wants him needy and weak, and so I suppose yeah. like children learn to manipulate the parents, don't they? You know, that's it's that sort of thing again. Like he's playing to what he knows she wants, which is him to be dependent. 
Yeah, I think that's a really... Sorry, I'm just processing it because, as you've said... No, it. no, I, you, as you mentioned this scene, I was kind of like, you're right, because it is, it is super, you know, because obviously when, you know, in that scene, you're thinking, oh, you know, like, you know, yeah. she must not, you know, she must not see what is hiding and stuff, but it is super harrowing to, you know, to, to think in, you know, in those terms as well, exactly that, you know, he's learned how how she, you know what she responds to um and you know and and manage to play that like a child would Ooh. yeah it's great it's awful isn't it and i and i think when you watch it like that as well you're thinking oh geez this is terrible like and it's and yeah like she knows best she knows what's best you know she's she's set his legs she's done this she's done and she is that very um i suppose all-encompassing presence Mm -hmm. which again for children you know generally well parents are but you know we only ever talk about bad mums don't we (laughs) and i'm just talking about bad dads um but yeah and i think again that's interesting for it to be a man doing that so a man Mm -hmm. like him him in that you know the how they play with perspective even from beginning when you can see it she's like i'm your number one fan and she's looking down on him like this presence above him and then when he's in his wheelchair and obviously she's standing over him and he's begging her for, you know, he's pleading. And I think to put a man, mm-hmm. particularly someone like James Kahn, who is, you know, who looks very traditionally like masculine, doesn't he? He's a man, yeah. he's a guy. <laughs> That's <laughs> a man's of, man. <laughs> yeah, a man's man, you know. I think to put him in that position as well is is very interesting. And, I, and I'm sure it made people uncomfortable. And maybe that were part of yeah. the tension in it is is watching this dynamic be so totally flipped and subverted. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting, actually, that the dynamic is, you know, because at first when, you know, she's taking care of him and he's, you know, he's, he's kind of almost on the charm offensive, right? Mm-hmm. Because, like, he's kind of, you know... Um, kind of pandering a little bit you know her being like you know your number one fan and you know I think you know it's, it's a dance that he's done obviously a million times mm. you know with you know with other with other people with other women um and yet you know with with uh with Annie it's kind of different right because she is a woman but she you know she is presented in a way that is so non-conformist to you know, to that idea of femininity, mm. I think. Again, in, you know, going back to the idea of her being, you know, um, re- read as the, you know, the monstrous mother, I think, um, you know, she's also that, you know, a figure of, um, you know, figure of uh, of objection, mm. right? Because she's, she's, the way she behaves, you know, she makes big noises, she <laughs> overeats, she crosses social, social, societal boundaries throughout, mm. you know, throughout the film. So, so yeah, it's, it's it, you know in terms of their dynamic, it's almost like you know he's trying to, you know, to interact with with her the way he has done with fans, you know, ac- across his life, and you mm. know it's, it soon becomes apparent that she is a different kettle of fish, right? Yeah, absolutely, and I and I think as well, it's that idea that men, and I always think in horror, uh, particularly like men have never got any survival instinct. <laughs> <laughs> you know, mm, because yeah, yeah, but it's because exactly. they don't have to. So it's not learned. It's not sort of something that you've been learning since childhood, like for women. Like a woman had to walk up in that bed with two broken legs and thought, shit, <laughs> shit, mm-hmm. what am I going to do here? Whereas he's just like, oh, Annie Wilkes, my number one fan's going to nurse me back to health. This is all fantastic. There's no exactly. alarm bells for ages <laughs> until she's like exactly. screaming about, you know, his book and the cursing in it and everything. And it's dirty it, birdie. You dirty birdie. You know, but even, <laughs> even, <laughs> as, even as she talks, <laughs> it's so weird. It's like, and that's another thing that marks her out as so strange. Like when she's like, oh, I don't want to make you feel oogie. And she's like, oh, you're just another lying old dirty <laughs> birdie. And then like, did I do good? She sounds like, did I do good? Did I do it right? Like desperate for approval from him, but then can't take criticism. So when she's bought wrong paper, yeah. she's like furious that he's, he's <laughs> called her out on it and like, you know, wax his legs. It's <laughs> It's like... <laughs> She's very the way, but what I like about that as well is that she's always very like you know oh he didn't get out the cock of doody car and she talks in this really forced way again like presenting herself as this person who don't curse and then right at the end she's like you cocksucker <laughs> <laughs> and she's strangling him and you think yes live your truth Annie 
<laughs> I swear. But again, that's another repression, isn't it? It's another. Yes, exactly, exactly. Repression, and you know, her, um, you know, her conception, you know, conception of femininity that she's, you know, she's built reading mm. those novels, you know, and 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 she, again, you know, she's kind of absorbed this and made this her personality. You know, she's kind of like this. She's living living vicariously through those books mm. and thinking, you know, that if she can present herself <laughs> as misery, then you know, then she will be. She, you know, all of a sudden she is what is expected, you know, in society for a woman to be. But if she just yeah. can't keep the pretense. Well, that's it. And I think and also... Pissing her off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you cock a doody cock sucker, Paul Sheldon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but, I'm going to use... I want to have a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, merch coming soon. Um, I think it's, it's... Again, though, it's that, like, parasocial relationship as well, this, like, obsessive fan that, she, you know, when she's talking about, oh, you know, there's there's the swear... The language in this book, Paul. And he's like, oh, you mean the swearing? And she's like, it has no nobility. Like Annie Wilkes knows what I'm not, you know, this is not me casting aspersions on her background, but it's that nobility because she's reading Mm -hmm. these Victorian romance novels and there's no nobility to this cursing. And when he challenges it and he's like, you know, I were a slum kid, this is how people talk. It disrupts that perception of him and she cannot let that be, you know, be be tarnished in a way. And so she reacts in Mm -hmm. this really aggressive, like over top manner. But I do think that's a really interesting aspect to it. You know, it's this complexity, like creativity as well. Like what he's famous for, he's ashamed of. Yeah. But what, but for Annie, like these misery books that he just despises as give meaning to her life at a time when she were really struggling. And there's this like, duality in that relationship that and then you know she's got this signed photo and he's signed this photo with no idea where it would go in and that's like confronting him as well that you know there's these people there out in the world who know him in quotes but he don't know who they are and it's so frightening yeah sorry yeah. and it's it's you know it, and it's so performative as well mm. right because you you know what she gets so aggro about uh, about this and about you know the lack of nobility as you say mm. You know, and she, you know, there's that scene where she's on, you know, she serves him dinner, like a you know, really nice home cooked dinner. And then she disappears to her bedroom and she's watching some trash TV yeah. with, a, you know, two two litre Pepsi and, you know, and, and, a, and a bag of Cheetos. Yeah. And, you know, she, in, in that moment being, you know, a woman in the 20th century and, you know, not having to... Yeah, not having to perform for anyone, mm. and all of a sudden, it's then being that cons- you know, that that consumer, you know, who, in the same way, she is that consumer for those, you know, those 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 trash novels, mm. you know, <laughs> but, but finds that you know nobility in them. Uh, yeah, that, uh, and I did notice that actually. I thought that were really interesting that she'd give him this, you know, a meal on a tray with a doily and a napkin, mm-hmm. and you know, knife and fork, and he's like eating it, and then she's just eating a bag of crisps, watching blind date or whatever it is that the american yeah. equivalent and it is that it's almost like she can't accept that is that is also a different part you know she puts him on such a pedestal yeah. for, um, pedestal for being you know the writer of these novels as if he himself was part of was part of that world and i know in in you know in in the novel obviously there is you know he has those um there is, you know, moments of being in and out of consciousness mm. where where he is in, you know, in that universe, in the, in the, mm. you know, in the in the in the novel where she is sort of a, she's a, a goddess who can't be killed or something like this mm. in the in the novel, but um, but yes, actually can't disassociate him from you know from that alternate reality. Uh, yeah, and it, when you know when she says like I love you, Paul, and then she's like you mind your creativity, mm-hmm. like, but she don't love him. She loves the idea of him. She's created through yeah. reading these books, and that again, I think he's so sinister when we think about like parasocial relationships and and you know mm-hmm. ideas that people build up about celebrities, about writers, people they've never met, but they feel this connection that they've created to them, and then when that's challenged and it erupts in viol- into violence, like it does in misery, you know, and and this idea that that he's made a mistake with misery as though it's not his anymore. Mm -hmm. And again, I think, you know, when you think about, I suppose, Stephen King as an author writing that and thinking about, you know, is is, there's this, I think we see it more and more with social media as well. I'm trying not to go on my soapbox here, but I'm probably going to, I mean, it is me. Um, (laughs) But, you know, this idea that people think they're entitled to 
people's energy and the time and they're entitled Indeed. to be responded to and and they're, they're entitled to know about people's lives and details of, of the, so the personal life that that this is so oh well that you shouldn't be famous then the price you pay for being famous is that everybody's in your business all the time um mm-hmm. and and as an author to to have made a decision about your work, you know, the gall of people, like how galling it must be to have people go, no, you've done that wrong. You shouldn't have finished this book like that. It's like, this is my book. <laughs> you write a book. I wrote it. Um, and, and, you know, but then it is it is such a weird one because it's like she's making him write misery and he don't want to write misery, but then you can see from it that it gets, it like reinvigorates him in a way mm-hmm. as, as, a, as, a, as an artist again. And obviously then at the end of the film he's written another book that he's done just for himself because he wanted to do it but it's like although it was a really awful traumatic experience it's as though it's like giving him back something that he'd lost in a way yeah which again adds that the depth to that dynamic that if misery yeah you know, or accepted something that is completely rejected right i think yeah. by the you know at the end he seems to kind of be at peace with uh, his you know his, his his full body of work instead mm. of being kind of like well I'm gonna um, you know ditch misery and um, you know and move on to bigger and better, better things and in terms of what we mentioned at the start of the podcast about the idea of the you know the the monster has to die because there's no place in society but the interesting thing I think with misery is also yes you know she she dies but you know the fact that you know he has you know I love the ending of the mm. film it's just so powerful because you can see that she she will always exist, right? Yeah. And, you know, she will always be a part of him. And this is where, again, like that reading about addiction then comes, you know, then comes, absolutely, you know, yeah. circle back, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> I think, uh, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Like, and, you know, that woman saying, oh, I'm your number one fan and, like, it must send a chill through him. Like, you know, PTSD, mm-hmm. absolutely, from the, <laughs> this experience. <laughs> um, but, yeah, yeah, and that idea that the shadow of it remains and you have to be vigilant, you know, you have to be vigilant against Indeed, it yeah. because you could slip back sort of thing. And I think that is an interesting interpretation of that ending but also as one of i mean it is a it is a narrative about domestic violence as well you know yeah that when she and she she is very much a a, i think personifies a very typical abuser narrative you know like she when she's talking to me about burning book and you don't want to do it and she's like just throwing casually throwing that lighter fluid on him the threat is there, but she's not She's not giving voice to that threat. That's in your mind, Paul. Mm-hmm. But she's covering you in lighter fluid and she's got a book of matches. Mm-hmm. Like, the threat mm-hmm. is there and this, like, destabilising, you know, gaslighting of him and obviously take it, getting him addicted to pain pills, getting it so she can control him because she controls when he suffers. And then she's, again, that idea about this, like, angel of mercy, she's the one who relieves his suffering. She's made herself integral in his life. And I think you know wanting to just be normal like, like why wouldn't you do that one thing for me it's yeah like, like, you know you you can rely on me for yeah. everything and i'll make you better and i'll make you, you better thing, and you know better. and yeah. i do so much for you even though no one asked her to i do so much for you exactly. and you can't yeah, do yeah. this and for i me. ask nothing in return yeah, yeah. <laughs> but how interesting to see this narrative portrayed in you know in this film and in pop culture at large as well from you know in with that um mm. Uh, gender role flip right because mm. actually you know it's very more often than not you know the the mm. reality is that you know women are abused um yeah you know by men so it's like it's a very interesting dynamic to see it um portrayed in that way there and but but in such a way that you can read so many other things you know within mm. it so well and he, and he can't get away from her uh, literally mm-hmm. and you know even like she when he hides that knife she finds it it she knows he's being out it's like this she's, she's like, wise to yeah, you know, yeah she's like omnipotent she's like she knows everything that's going on in, is, yeah. and and he can't he can't oh doesn't she say about the um the yeah when he, penguin she knows, she knows that he's been in this yeah, yeah. The penguin. it's versus june <laughs> north pal like oh sorry oh. How could I have? I know, how could I, I have been mistaken? I thought there was such um, such a mum thing as well, you know. To, yeah. <laughs> to bring it. Don't touch like, my ornaments. Exactly. Where ornaments. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, and I think you know she um, it, it has to end in this violent confrontation. There's no other way for him to get out of it. And you know it is. I mean, when he's like you know shoving burning paper down her throat. I mean, it, it doesn't hold back. And I'm glad because again, it could have if he'd have been like, oh, I can't hit her. She's a woman. He's like, no, have this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know? and I think that's good because that that gives 
respect to she's the fact she's become dehumanized at this stage yeah. as well yeah, yeah but yeah. yeah she does and she does become demonized but i think it also affords the respect of she is a threat she is a threat and she yes, needs yeah. to be managed like a threat, not like, oh, it's just some woman who I can just really easily have a power. You know, she is a threat to him. And I think it's um it it's good that it ended that way, I think. If he'd have just if he'd have managed to just drug her and then, you know, it, it, there's no there's not there's no satisfaction in that because she is um a worthy adversary. And I think if they'd have done it in a different way, it wouldn't have recognised that, maybe. Maybe that's just mm-hmm. me. Maybe I'm weird. I don't know. <laughs> no, 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 no. I totally agree. No, no. Yeah, no. I meant she, she's she, she's dehumanized by the end yeah. of the you know, but by the end of, of the film. So she is. She just become. She is just that threat. Mm. You know, by the end of it, rather than rather than throughout the film when you get a glimpse of, you know, that scene where you know where it's raining and you know she has the gun. You've talked about it, but mm. you know, there's. It's almost you know. You feel like at this point in the film there could almost be a. A switch, you know, he could almost talk her off the ledge, and and yeah. you know, and and you know, the film could go in a different, in a, in a different direction. Absolutely, but then it yeah. and she just, she just then goes down the, you know, the full, full monstrous route. <laughs> yeah, but absolutely, and I think, like you said, that's when these two worlds collide. So we're upstairs in a bathrobe eating crisps. And and the the Annie she presents for him, that's where that mask drops because she can't sustain it anymore. And he sees who she mm-hmm. really is, or part of who she really is. Um, and there's an intimacy to that as well that I think is, you know, it, again, speaks to this complexity of their dynamic, that there is an intimacy to it, that she, you know, she's washing him, she's dressing him, she's taking care of him, but then she's letting him in to her inner life and, and being vulnerable in front of him. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's that adds to it as well you know like when she says you'll never know what it's like for someone like me to to lose someone like you um oh no yeah. that's not what she says don't, you'll never know the fear of losing someone like you when you're someone like me and i think that that really sort of positions it as this idea of power like even though she's got the yeah. physical power he still holds power over her because of who she thinks he is and who he, what he means mm-hmm. to her um and it is just yeah, really... which then puts that idea of uh, which then puts that idea of 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 abuse into another into mm. a different light, right? Because you know it's you know even though she is the um, perpetrator of you know of the uh, emotional and physical abuse, it's like she suffers a form of abuse that you know of, of her own making, mm. of course. But you know she is not a you know she you know we were talking about you know uh you know other monsters in film like michael myers and stuff like this like she's not impervious to pain yeah yeah and she feels pain and she feels very deeply and pain and rejection yeah and, and you know has clearly suffered at the end of you know society and you mm. know and, and other men and stuff so it's all that um uh, yeah, repressed anger that's uh, coming coming out. Apple. Yeah. <laughs> well, shall we uh, have a chat about? Well, there's no specific folklore corner this week. Try hard as I might, because I did try and find any folklore about sort of you know obsessive fans, but none exists. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. Not yet. <laughs> but I, I did think about that idea about parasocial relationships because I think it's a really interesting one, and also like can be really mm-hmm. dangerous. Um, and you know, it's it, they arise out of this repeated contact with with personalities, you know, through media and things like that, and it causes a person to develop these illusions about intimacy and friendship, and also identification with that person. And so they've done studies on this, particularly around like children and adolescents, and and found that there's negative consequences around body image and like increased aggression, but also this distress when this relationship ends. So either somebody you know um, leaves a TV series, for instance, or something like that. But it can result in like stalking behavior, which arises. And I think for Annie, generally women stalkers are seen as suffering from erotomania, which is this idea that this other person loves her. And I don't think that Annie ever thinks Paul loves her. She hopes he will, but she doesn't believe Mm -hmm. he does. Um, But this comes from a lot of time from women who are sort of shy and sexually inexperienced, which does seem to fit, I suppose, with Annie. Um, an object at delusion is a man who seems unattainable, which obviously Paul Sheldon does until she rescues him from a blizzard, you know. Um, and I think she also seems to fit this type of like intimacy seeking 
an intimacy seeking stalker. She, you know, she's really trying to create this force, this dynamic. Um, but there are quite a few cases of celebrities who've had really terrible experiences and I didn't want to go too deep into it because, you know, we're not that sort of podcast, but, no, um, not a tr- yeah. You know, uh, fake horror, fine. Real horror. <laughs> uh, leave me out exactly. of it. But, you know, Jodie Foster had a stalker, John Inkley Jr., um, who were obsessed with her and even enrolled at Yale when she were there and tried to get in the same classes and he used to put notes under a door. Um, and to prove his love for her, he shot President Reagan um, and he shot him in chest. And obviously Ronald Reagan survived, but he was sentenced to life in a psychiatric institution, as you would be for trying to assassinate Terrifying. a president. Terrifying, yeah. Um, and Rebecca Schaefer is a, a, a famous case. She um, was stalked for three years by, uh, I've not even noted his name down, which is probably the right thing to do. Uh, but she'd been stalked for three years. She'd been on a TV series and she was trying to move into, um, you know, different films. And he was, he, she appeared in a scene in bed with another character and he this stalker went berserk and said she's just become another Hollywood whore. So, you know, shows what he really thought about her. And he were able to get her home address by paying a PI $250 to get it through the DMV. So he turned up at a house. She asked him to leave. He tried to get to her on set, but security had turned him away. Um, and he shot her in point blank uh, on a doorstep when she answered the door to him. So this were really, obviously a really horrible case, but it did lead to anti-stalking laws that were enacted in America in 1990 and the Driver's Pri- Privacy Protection Act in 94. That means that people can't access driver's personal information through DMV records, which mm. so, seems to me like that should have been the way from the start. Mm-hmm. Should I be in know. place already? But okay. Um, you know. But in terms of like killer um, nurses, they're often called angels of death or angels of mercy. And as a forensic psychologist, um, we do know that women do tend to fall into these categories, tend to be poisoners uh, and smotherers rather than more violent means. Um, but you can split these into three types. So there's like merciful who believe that people are suffering and they're putting them out of the misery, sadistic who are using the position to exert power and control and malignant heroes who are putting a person in danger to be seen as saving them, even though they know they can't mm-hmm. be saved, but they want to have that position of the, you know, saving the day. Um, I've got a UK case example, actually, which is quite depressing. Uh, Beverly Allett was convicted of killing... Um, Four children in a hospital ward. Um, she attempted to kill three more and was charged with GBH on a further six over a 59-day period. And staff became suspicious about the number of cardiac arrests they were seeing in uh, these children. Uh, so I reported it to the police and she was the nurse in charge on all the shifts and had access to all the drugs that were used. So things like um, insulin overdoses and things like that. Um and so she was given 13 concurrent life sentences and she's currently in Rampton Secure Hospital in Nottinghamshire. So <laughs> lock your <Hey>. doors. <laughs> um, but a psychologist and a criminologist both evaluated her and said that she weren't mentally ill and she should be in prison, not in a hospital. But she's fought this far to keep in Rampton. Um, and she were ordered to serve 30 years. So 13 consecutive life sentences with a minimum tariff of 30 years and a tariff ended in November 2021 and she is eligible for parole now. Um, I think they've made a. Uh, I think they've made it. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I think they've made a TV show of it because uh, that sounds familiar. And uh, it's one of these things I know you and I have mm. talked about that quite a lot. And it's uh, I understand why people are fascinated by this kind of thing, but it's mm. just I, I'm like, just stop making the shows. Like, stop making stop, shows. Stop. stop I don't yeah. want to stop yeah, glamor- stop glamorizing it. Really, aren't you? That's what um, exactly, what people yeah. are doing. But I mean, her motives, much like Annie's, are unknown. But they did suggest that she showed symptoms of factitious disorder by proxy which is also known as munchausen's by proxy so again the idea that she were putting people in arms way to to sort of um save them well not even to save them really but that i mean factitious like disorders a are, are weird anyway but yeah so that's the depressing true crime corner for this week um, I prefer the full, I prefer the food lot. I have to say, <laughs> we'll, this we'll is why, full yeah, next week. This Much is better. why we don't do it. Let me talk about mermaids and like <laughs> tooth vaginas, please. Um, but it, you know, it, it just goes to show that this is not, although you know, it's a fictional um, story, that it's not actually. It is you know rooted in some fact, depressing as that may be. <laughs> Well, on that note then, shall we talk about recommendations? <laughs> let's talk about recommendations. Yeah, let's move on swiftly from that. <laughs> 
Although um, my films, my film recommendations uh, are um, probably not, uh, also not very jolly, to be fair. But uh, the first one that came to mind is Der Fan, um, actually. And I, uh, I wonder if you had it on your yeah, list. Yeah, I had it well. on my list. <laughs> it's one of my all-time favorites, yes. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I knew it's one of your favorites. So, same here. So um, obviously, that is definitely one uh, that goes alongside with. Um, I also thought of Single White Female. Yes. And The Hand That Rocks the Cradle. Oh, um, two excellent <laughs> Classics, classics of the genre, right? Yeah, you made me think. Actually, I haven't gone back to watch um, to watch them again, but mm. uh, I definitely, definitely want to do that. Well, maybe and they'll the last form one... part of a maybe some uh, um, some uh, something I, soon. I wasn't going to give any spoilers, <laughs> but maybe, maybe we have something uh, <laughs> something in our sleeves with that. Um, and the last one that um, that came to mind is um, Doris, Do- Dolores Claiborne, which yes. is all, um, obviously an, an adaptation, another Stephen King adaptation that also features. Um, Kathy Bates and is absolutely excellent. Oh yeah, and the book as well. Yeah, Yeah. the book Mm -hmm. of it is also excellent as well. Well, I also had Der Fan combines my favourite things: (laughs) obsessive women and cannibalism. Um, But I had The Fan with Lauren Bacall. Um, who obviously stars as the agent in this and that is a very good one although apparently Lauren Bacall was quite unhappy with how violent it was when they edited it Um, but I Mm -hmm. very much enjoy it and think it's good I had Fresh um, that you know someone kept in captivity a very good one Um, (laughs) and uh, I had King of Comedy uh, on here which is interesting because it's obviously it's two um two men so uh, one man obsessed with the other but it's it's very good um and my final one is one of my all-time favorite films which is play misty for me another one about yes, Excellent, yes. love play misty for me <laughs> uh so yes we've got lots of obsessive uh examples yeah. <laughs> i know i mean like it could definitely could be the basis of a new podcast season who knows who um, knows obsessive women who knows <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to Monsters Flesh. Please join us next time for more discussion about women in horror. You can find out more about us via our website, monstersflesh.co.uk, where you can find out more about our research for each episode, buy our wonderful merch and see our, um, our upcoming events. We'd love to hear from you, either via our email or social media channels. Also, please, please, please rate and review wherever you listen to podcasts and help us spread our spooky word by telling all your friends about Monsters Flesh. And until next time, creep it with everyone.